And aspects that are particularly important uh, for Linux for uh, this course relate to the um, uh, use of uh, file navigation, right? So that's important, being able to run programs, um, dealing with permissions, and you guys seem to be reasonably strong on uh, this, um, the way it looked. Um, user management is actually less of a concern than uh, because um, generally um, you, you have basically isolated instances, uh, you know, in which in which you basically just use one user anyway for execution. So that's not a terrible concern, but we can brush up on this as well if if you, um, there's interest afterwards. But aspects that seem to be more uh, per pertinent, more relevant, possibly also for uh, the remainder of this um, course. Uh, relate to the um, um, principles of um, piping again, just a revision there. Um, and uh, in conjunction with redirection, I think those two pair quite well. And uh, then I'll briefly look into um, process management um, because, uh, you know, while it's again not a not a core theme, I think it's quite useful because then you should want to be um, kind of kind of be comfortable to kind of evaluate and uh, assess the state of your machine uh, with respect to load and so on, but also to be able to control programs and so on. Um, in conjunction with this, I'll then further look into um, the the uh, principles of System D briefly. Uh, as a kind of um, startup manager or a process manager in the widest sense, uh, as it exists in modern um, Linux distributions, pretty much in, in nearly all of them, there are exceptions, of course, but uh, um, that's that's one thing you want to kind of briefly go over as well. Um, and um, then finally, see how far we get. We look into software um, um, package management, no other sense, under Ubuntu again, uh, with primary focus, but just to get an overview of what's available, what's possible, and um, kind of functionality to get out of the box. Um, so first things first, um, one thing I'm always intrigued to know is, uh, or, or to understand more, is actually, um, you know, the, the usage of the term Linux in the widest sense. When when we use Linux, what are the possible interpretations on your part, just to get a feeling? Okay, operating system, sounds good, yep. Yeah. Uh, are there other viewpoints? I'm uh, GNU there. Oh, okay. Oh, now it's getting interesting. Uh, yep. Um, and 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 yep. Uh, okay. So if you, I mean, uh, when it comes to operating system, I think we have a reasonably, possibly a reasonably clear understanding. Or do we? Right. So when you think about operating system, what what do you think? Um, yep. There's another point. Just uh, reading it out here. A type of open source OS. Uh, which there are various distros of. So, yep, there's also um, a, a completely um, sensible interpretation. But if we go back to the operating system, when you think about operating system, what is part of the operating system? Yep, there's the kernel. So what's the kind of informal or formal definition of a kernel? In, in yeah, any operating system, really. Exactly. I mean, yeah, you're essentially right. So, you know, so that is the system calls, basically. That's uh, something Ellen uh, su um, suggests, and that's correct. Well, there's a, this kind of uh, intuitive um, uh, understanding that's basically the program that runs, it, runs in any case at all times, right? The kernel, you can't switch off the kernel and still expect your machine to be running, whereas you can do that with most other uh, uh, software that runs, you know, services or, um, um, or non-system services, that is and um, um, applications, of course, right? So that's a kind of um, distinct differentiation. Um, the, the reason I'm asking uh, is, is generally that we have a bit of a conflated understanding when it comes to um, uh, operating systems. We always, I guess there's a bit of a bias that has been um, um, introduced based on our understanding of, let's say, Windows, for example, as a, you know, off-the-shelf ready-made kind of uh, um, operating system with all these features and tools and utilities and all, everything that comes along with this. Um, but I think in Linux, um, it's important to differentiate different understandings. And I just want to highlight this again. I'm not sure, again, if that's settled with you. If it is, then then uh, forgive me for this uh, iteration. But I think it's worthwhile to to discuss because uh, Linux provides us with this, you know, different orientations. And even you guys picked up on the different nuances already anyway. Um, um, so then uh, we need to be clear what we, we mean when we actually um, uh, talk about kernel. So. In the Linux sense, there are kind of three different um, 
<laughs> uh, yes, if anyone uh, wants to have a, have a laugh, have a look at the chat. Um, so uh, the, 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 the differentiation is essentially there, that Linux can be stratified into uh, kind of those three understandings, one of them being kernel and kernel only. Right. And kernel only kind of means, you know, without the surrounding uh, kind of kind of uh, software ecosystems in terms of utilities and all that kind of jazz that you may even need to interact with the kernel, but mere, merely and barely the kernel itself. And that makes it, it makes it so attractive in many instances, particularly for for, let's say, embedded system or not so much those, but but for for, uh, you know, um, 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 the you know for 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 um, automation in particular because you can remove strip off pretty much anything you don't need right so you know starting of course with the applications that you wouldn't need in the first place when uh, for example we as uh, or uh, when we as Windows user think about this and we oftentimes even treat Paint as part of the operating system becomes because it's simply a ship with this but uh, even this uh, of course this sensibly but also even utilities for the management of the operating system that you would expect in Linux don't necessarily need to be present even in the Linux kernel variant right so and um, and just uh, bring up a, um, uh, anyone let me just share the screen to share some intuitions, perhaps that helps a bit. Um, get back to Linux anyway, but um, hang on. But um, the, the idea is there that um, it's really, you know, the bare kernel. And I think that the point is the exposure of the system calls is the key here um, that's uh, available, right? So the system call interface, how this is interacted with is a different story. And that would be outside of the kernel already, could be kind of user space if we talk about uh, Linux in, in a wider sense. And we talk Linux about the wider sense, it's often referenced as GNU Linux. What does it mean? Well, um, GNU Linux is basically the idea that we have the kernel that is only and only focused on uh, the the the, the um, you know management of processes and uh, linkage to the underlying hardware and exposure of the system call interface alongside selected services and so on, um, particularly with respect to hardware uh, uh, well resource management. Yeah, anyway. Um, but we also have the surrounding utilities that are usually come as, you know, the GNU tools, for example, or the core utils um, that are uh, an additional, uh, um, um, you know, package that you would need to install. And those eventually start to contain all the commands you make to, or many of the commands you actually know from the command line. So they are not part of the kernel itself or the Linux in the narrowest sense, if you like, in the kernel sense, but they actually come as part of uh, GNU utils, uh, utilities, right? So if um, if you guys are aware, I mean, the idea is that um, the GNU movement was certainly preceding Linux uh, by um, nearly 10 years. And I think it started in 1983. Uh, like in a more prominent way. And the idea was basically to port many of the, you know, well-known Unix utilities into the kind of, um, you know, in a, in a license uh, or in a kind of an open sourcey uh, uh, fashion. So people could actually start using them, but not being tied to uh, very expensive Unix licenses, which were usually based on um, uh, pricing, based on mainframe usage and so on. And, um, and, uh, but the only thing they didn't have was an operating system or let's say a kernel. And, uh, you know, and they have come um, through the years, there, there have been efforts even since then to kind of come up with a kernel. Does anyone know what's the, what's the, what's the orthodox uh, um, GNU kernel actually called? That's right. That's right. A uh, hurt is the response there. Um, that's absolutely right. So the idea was basically uh, you know, have, having a herd of GNU's. That was the kind of metaphor that was basically uh, kind of invoked at that time. Uh, and you know this, this herd, the kernel being the core. However, it never got really um, too far. In fact, there there are instances. Herd, herd is actually now uh, um, possibly nearly nearly be usable in production. There are um, variants of Debian that have herd as an underlying kernel, but uh, in practice they have never gotten as far. And one of the key points was, um, of course, features in terms of utilities that are available, they can do as a user, but more, more importantly, driver support. It's a big thing. Even today, I mean, about, uh, you guys will know that Linux is a monolithic kernel and uh, you'll hopefully learn that it's an operating system as, as a, uh, you know, typical example. And it also means that uh, the kernel actually has um, most of the drivers um, that it needs to support for the underlying hardware embedded in the kernel itself, or as part of the, the, the kernel package. And, uh, you know, nearly amounting to, uh, I think, 60 to 70% of the actual code base, just driver support. And um, 
this is a challenge to maintain this. And I, I heard never got the community to do that. Instead, they, this community focused on primarily providing utilities, tools, software, you know, all the things you kind of love uh, uh, to use when you think about open source software, like, you know, um, um, yeah. Yeah. So any uh, around this um, development, but um, so and the idea is GNU Linux in combination basically means, okay, now we have the kernel plus the surrounding utility tool or software ecosystem, which kind of makes GNU Linux, right? If you read this reference and then the, then the widest sense, uh, we then have kind of with the diversity uh, of the GNU Linuxes plus X and X being um, de facto, you know, a specific set of applications that um, uh, the distribution provider um, um, associates or kind of ties into this particular distribution because it's kind of uh, reflecting a particular purpose, right? So it may be usability, it may have a UI or not, it may have uh, security features or maybe entirely focused on security um, or um, um, like tails uh, um, or um, um, for audio um, video uh, processing, AV Linux, I think is one distribution for this purpose. General purpose ones with, uh, you know, and Entry user accessibility are possibly like Ubuntu formally, I guess. Nowadays, there are other ones that are uh, um, more, more fundamental or other ones that uh, emphasize a rolling release concept um, like Arch or that focus on recency, Fedora, um, and so on. So of um, embedded software, right? So, um, or stability, conversely, that would be Debian, one of the more uh, aged Linux distributions. But anyway, I just want to get across the sentiment that we have a stratified understanding. When you when you say Linux, it's always important to kind of gauge, um, you know, or understand, of course, what you're talking about. But also, if you talk to someone else, to understand what they are talking about, right? Because this is understanding may not necessarily be aligned. Many people conflate, for example, Linux with, with a distribution, specific distribution, let's say Ubuntu. And this is not kind of, uh, uh, um, you know, unexpected to some extent, because in many instances, you know, you are only taught one or um, uh, it, you know one or very few distributions in the first place for uh, you know um, productivity reasons mostly. Um, cool. And there's another comment by Berlin uh, suggesting that a lot of people actually mean anything related to Unix as well. Yeah, there's this conception that uh, you know Linux is Unix uh, to, to to some extent, and that's not far fetched either because one of the purposes um, of Linux was basically to uh, well, essentially, to be honest, rewrite a lot of functionality that's out of the box available in, in a Unix system, but to ensure that it's based on a license that allows its free use and reuse, right? So that was one of the key challenges where in the earlier times, um, I'm sure if I have a slide on that one, actually, I'm not sure, let's see. Um, uh, in, in earlier times, there was really a very, very in, in, intense uh, competition about different Unix distributions, and uh, especially if you deployed mainframes, was challenging to think about, you know, which particular edition you, of course, want to use, and then which particular variant of Unix, um, you know, and all of which has some strings attached. Some of them being indeed openly available, but again, not for PC um, architectures, or you know, um, whereas others um, were completely um, had to be licensed and very expensive. And Linux kind of, kind of took kind of the best or, yeah, I don't know, in any case, something from both worlds. And this included also, re, you know, porting a lot of the different functionality that's existing. So, uh, in fact, many um, seasoned uh, Unix users will not have a hard time changing or, um, you know, moving to Linux um, uh, thereafter because they find many of the functionality they're accustomed to there again. Anyway, I don't necessarily want to entrench this uh, deeper. Um, We'll, um, we'll, we'll perhaps revisit this even later in the session, but I just wanted to ensure that we all have a shared understanding of what Linux actually means, uh, because that would be, uh, uh, I think, really important, uh, you know, going going from here to kind of ensure that you use the terminology correctly. Okay, um, with this mini detour, um, because it's, there's still an element of expir exploration how far you are um, comfortable with the underlying concepts, but I understand that many of you have the foundations. But I want to go into a few things uh, for today uh, related to um, you know selected features, as I mentioned. So we talk a bit of very very practical, I guess, very much about piping processes and services or service management in the widest sense. Um, that's probably the better way of putting it. So it's a bit ill fated here. And first of all, let's let's uh, clear a bit of our terminology. Um, so um, and um, then we look into those individual actions uh, aspects. And if we have time, we look into software management as well. In any case, I provide resources for all those aspects. I also provide more foundational resources uh, on Linux so that people can iterate through if they are, you know want to kind of briefly revise. 
uh, their understanding uh, of, of yeah, let's say, um, things like permissions, user management, and so on, or um, hard links and soft links as a concept in the file system, and so on. I'm not going into any of those for now, but uh, if you at some stage later in the course certainly see the need or the necessity arises, then we can revisit those aspects. So um, I'm, I'm kind of a bit of a fan to uh, of being kind of agile where needed, and then kind of uh, you know. Kind of feed um, resources where 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 they are eventually missing. But in any case, I think all the um, courses that you had had so far on Linux should provide you with the necessary foundation. Okay, um, but now um, moving a bit back or uh, stepping back and back into operating systems, I suspect one of the key things that we need to understand when we think about interaction with different processes and uh, the software you're going to write. Uh, you know, is such a, a process eventually and kind of uh, responds to the same principles. So it's kind of worthwhile to revisit this. However, I hope you have seen this in operating systems, but I just want to operationalize this in context of Linux specifically. And um, so the, the idea is there basically that uh, we have the concept of um, standard streams, right? So, and um, the, the idea of standard streams is basically that each process exists somewhat, you know, in isolation or is managed by the operating system, but is largely, with care here, of course, largely autonomous with respect to its uh, internal operation, not with respect to when it can execute and not necessarily with respect to access to um, I.O. and so on. So there are certain aspects that are guarded by the scheduler that it can't just freely do, but within the code that you are writing when you write your, say, Go service eventually, um, you know, that is actually only managed by your by, by that very uh, program itself or in its instantiation, the process. So, but what the operating system can do is to interact with each process in, um, well, a select, uh, let's say, interact productively with each process. And um, um, when I mean productively, it's meaning, you know, feeding input, receiving output, but when it's about um, lifecycle management, it can also destroy processes not using any of those um, streams. But, um, so the the idea is an input stream is basically you know linked to um, um, usually to some sort of um, often hardware or I/O and basically provides input for a process that you know can be used for processing of course quite sensible uh, output conversely is what you would con conventionally see if you think about console output hello world standard kind of um, uh, experience that we have but on the output side there's a differentiation because processes can identify as to whether you know something went um, um, uh, correctly and as expected, so it's you know desired behavior or undesired behavior, and it can then differentiate the associated output for debugging purposes, for example, based on um, um, by, by having different uh, output streams, and that you can um, sensibly use in Linux and um, relate to. Um, how does the operating system, you know, differentiate between the output and the error stream? In the process output. So, if a process produces output, how does the operating system know whether it's um, standard output or um, standard error output? No? Okay, uh, well, uh, generally, there's the idea of exit codes that are associated with um, processes. I mean, if if you if I'm waiting too short, uh, you guys want to feel free to uh, just interrupt me. But um, the idea is that the exit code or status codes, rather, that's more the accurate way of saying it, um, associated with um, processes um, that are basically uh, signaling as to whether something was successful or not, whether status code zero signals that everything went fine and anything else is signaled by other status codes. And that can be used as an indicator as to whether um, something um, should be reported as an error or as a um, you know regular output. But um, uh, that thing aside, that's not too central of the point. We are now looking at it from a perspective of the operating system, and we we just want to see how we can consume whatever we get, you know, be it the standard output or error stream, more sensibly and usefully. I think you have learned about this. I would assume some feedback. I didn't see any nodding yet, but okay, we'll work on this. Um, Yes, you have learned about this. So the idea is basically that you can, you know, sensibly redirect, uh, 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 you know, input stream uh, or output stream and standard error output stream uh, and so on. And you can kind of productively use this if you, for example, where am I right now? Let's do a, um, um, well, a, cl a classic one that we will um, come to, I don't know, come to enjoy, but what I tend to, 
do it the most with is in the context of find, right? So if you use find to find files, um, I think you guys are comfortable. More more than half the time, you're probably spending uh, kind of um, thinking about, oh, I did it wrong again. I should either, um, you know, elevate permissions to it at Subo, so I have access to everywhere when I look for something, uh, or find other ways of kind of dealing with all this permission denied that's popping up, right? So when I, for example, what I had done is basically I was trying to find some a name uh, file that uh, to um, you know contain tests to some extent uh, throughout the entire file system. And of course, there are areas in the file system which I sensibly cannot access, as you know, but then it's really quite useful to kind of think about redirections, right? If you, for example, only uh, interested in the output um, that is actually productive, you can, of course, redirect. Doesn't really free you from the permission denied uh, feedback, but if you, for example, want to embed find as part of your own program, and you kind of want to ensure that you only get meaningful output, you can then, for example, redirect the output into um, um, another file. What is the how how can you um, redirect output into the uh, abyss? How can you suppress uh, error output? Definitely correct. Yeah, cool. Right, so that's the alternative. If you don't want to even deal with this somehow, or not even store it or whatever else, then you redirect it to dev. Null, cool. So so far so good, and then you ideally only have the concepts that are um, uh, relevant in your results file, right? So that's the idea. Cool. I mean, for those practical use cases, it can be really quite quite helpful to think about um, um, those redirections. And uh, there are variants of it, of course, you can use them largely for any sort of file system operation, or well, not any, but many uh, uh, um, file operations um, that would be either, you know, of course, creating a file using touch, but also then basically overwriting content as I just did or uh, appending to it, right? So you know this differentiation um, as well. And conversely, the opposite as well, if you provide file input. Two examples down there, um, if you, for example, want to append output from uh, PS um, to processes is easily done. And conversely, you can add attachments to mails if you have a mail you know, set up um, on your machine and you can send via command line using the mail command. Um, what does PS do? Gets running process, right? Is that something that has been, you have, yeah, okay. I sense you have talked about this. That's cool. Uh, that's very helpful. Cool. Um, right. So, so I talk about redirection right now, right? Super briefly and just to, to you know, remind you mostly, and that's the key idea. And similar with pipes. So, um, pipes are a, a, a kind of a concept that are kind of have, you know, been popularized in the context of Linux in particular, but it's by no means an exclusive one anymore. Um, so pipes have been, uh, in the meantime, adopted, um, you know, in, 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 in implicitly in Windows as well, especially as part of PowerShell, uh, um, and uh, to some extent has produced innovations that even go beyond what um, the uh, Linux pipes have to offer. But um, the the idea here is um, that you know, well, the idea is basically that you're able to chain commands sensibly, right? So the idea is, um, or it actually is born out of the Unix philosophy that each tool. Um, is only doing one job ideally, right? One job and does that job well. That's the key thing, right? There's always a go-to tool for any sort of activity. And your tasks as a you know, user is to cleverly combine those to kind of you know, get the functionality you need. And to do that, uh, the idea of piping was uh, uh, conceived here, which is kind of a very sensible um, um, direction, but also can lead quickly to complexity. Um, but I think just iterating uh, briefly over over this concept is uh, perhaps quite useful for um, um, you know to to ensure that we are all on the same um, page because you may actually need it for different purposes, especially when it comes to debugging or want to see certain output. So here's the output of uh, you know PS um, uh, AUX, so basically showing all the processes running a given system with a lot of detail and. Um, uh, so if you run PS without this, you basically just see your own pro processes in a short form, contrived form. You have a process ID. You know what the command is underlying it, the runtime the process had, and the terminal it's connected to right now is only one terminal, as you see here anyway. Um, and uh, the, the, the idea is basically that you can chain those commands then cleverly. And most likely you do something like, you know, um, grab or something. Uh, sorry, I forgot a... Um, uh, quotation mark and uh, so to, to extract certain elements of processes right so you can do it for files you want to explore file entries um, quite sensibly but also for for processes as you uh, may see uh, need and fit um, one 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 but here's a, um, a very useful feature I'm not sure what, that I use a lot when I debug especially more complex change is the use of um, T what does T do 
see, let me see, bring the chat back up. Um, bum, bum, bum. And the response was trees. Um, perhaps it's going in the right direction, but I'm not 100% sure. But um, any, any other view what, what um, T would do? What's the purpose of T? Yeah, exactly, right? It splits the output, right? So um, to kind of, the idea is that you redirect the output in a kind of T fashion. So that actually, you know, while you're piping through that pipe, you actually can kind of, um, uh, you know, dump all the content uh, that's going through that pipe into a file intermittently. And that's really quite nice because then you can actually uh, kind of use this to kind of uh, do some some debugging, right? Especially if you have more extensive pipes, it's really useful to think about T as one way of kind of debugging those and figuring out that things are uh, running okay and you can do it in different steps and so on, and then eventually remove it back. So I really like that um, feature personally quite quite um, well, right? So um, use cases are diverse. Do, we have, do you guys have a practical use case? One that I use quite a bit is this one here, for example. If I look at uh, etc, which is, you know, very important directory, it uh, contains pretty much all the configuration files. At least it should contain all the configuration files by by specification. But the problem is it's rather long, right? So if you if you inspect it individually and then it becomes a bit tedious to kind of see what you actually want and so on. And uh, there, you know, you can pipe it easily into tools like less, which actually take pipe input and then you can navigate through uh, this output quite um, conveniently. So um, that, that's that's one use case. Uh, or um, if you just want to filter parts of that one. So for example, you have an um, LSATC and you want to filter, um, what could we do? Um, I don't, yeah, no, of course, that, the obvious ones. Uh, you know, the last four entries, um, let's say, um, hang on, what did I do wrong? I uh, forgot the dash here, there you go. So last four entries of the output basically quite quite sensibly. And uh, in fact, you're perhaps you're only interested in get the fourth last entry. You can simply chain this again and say, hey, I only want the head entry from there. So you get the fourth last entry of the ETC folder or something like that, um, whatever that purpose would be. Um, but again, there's this, this really this flexibility of um, doing quite a bit of interesting um stuff um from a debugging point of view just one one thing uh so some of the um, points that i'm making here um uh, you know i'm somewhat complimentary because they may help you later on when you think about uh, particular purposes or problems challenges uh, that you have debugging output and and all that kind of stuff so uh one tool that in, in conjunction with this can be actually be used quite useful is uh, tail i just showed you tail briefly what does it do well it shows you the end of the file eventually right by default i think the last 10 lines of a file so if you have uh, tail out txt it just shows you a task link entry so you can parameterize it as you saw just now um, but it has other kind of really useful purposes and that's tail uh, dash f right so that's it's actually quite nice because this way you can um, for example monitor logs as they're relevant right so you may have a syslog and every time there's something written to it uh, you can uh, let's say it's produce something some user um, log stuff whatever so you see it's actually you know immediately following so it's a blocking command you can easily run your kind of command line alongside your productivity quite conveniently and so on but you can also use then of course that in conjunction with uh, filtering if you for example know the prefix of your um, um, of your output that you produce with your application and so on then it's really helpful because it will filter of course only on those events right so um, so for example if I type error, um, ah yeah, it's yeah, user was not the best of choices, uh, I guess. Uh, let's say it's called event. Um, then you have, for example, an error output. You wouldn't see it, but if you have, uh, you know, something that contains event in some way or another, you would actually get a, get a notification. So this way, you can kind of nicely follow output of a, you know, log file, whatever else, continuously in a separate terminal and only listen for events you're actually interested in. So um, this 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 kind of is a very cheap way of kind of making your life a lot lot easier. And debugging is something you definitely want to keep an eye on. Because especially if your services are starting to run headless, uh, meaning you know without ability to directly interact on your part, then it's really useful to have those logging capacities. You will learn to appreciate them. I wouldn't go as far as to say you will learn to love them, but in any case, you will get very used to them uh, and should be. Um, because there's nothing worse uh, than suggesting that, oh, my, my program is not supposed to do what it supposed to do and not getting any output related to that. So it's not necessarily always um, helpful. 
Okay. Um, yes. So, um, well, of course, then um, you guys, did you learn about regular expressions as well? Or I, they're not like super important for the course, but just to get a feel. In the past, I used to do one entire session on those things. We did. Okay, cool. You're comfortable with this. That's cool. So I don't need to deeply uh, uh, go into um, that one. Cool. All right. So um, yeah, basically that's that's some uh, some of the features that you can do with piping out of the box. They can of course do, of course do way more, right? So you can, I don't know, you can um, in in um, let's say take the earlier command ls uh, tail, and then you can sort elements in reverse order or uh, you know numerically or whatever else so there's quite a bit of um hang on that didn't quite work because i had the extended output i believe let's see if that's the issue yes um so um you know and, ch and chain arbitrary uh, commands again t is one one uh, friend you should have in mind tail dash f is something you want to keep for debugging um yeah anyway so but those are the major point um ah, yeah, one one pointer that i want to make is uh, related to um sometimes you have problems with piping not all commands support piping right they don't consume the input from a pipe uh, um, directly um so example is actually our good friend ls actually let's see ls l and we do tc so Let's assume we want to uh, kind of, um, of course, there are other ways, but let's assume we want to kind of show the content of uh, um, etc, the configuration file uh, folder eff effectively, and then have it uh, apply ls on all the subfolders as well. So we can actually explore them, right? Intuitively, you would say, hey, okay, let's change this. And ah, that was not what I wanted. Uh, change this, and you uh, should get some uh, meaningful output. And that's not, not quite what you expect here, right? So what it effectively does is that this is to some extent executed, uh, piped, uh, invisibly piped into ls, but ls does not recognize or accept it, and in fact just spits out the content of the current directory, right? So it forgoes this kind of chaining. Any ideas what you could do to kind of um, still chain those commands that actually don't take uh, pipe input? Yes, that's correct, right? So xargs is the way to go, just to mind that. So if you do that, then you would get... Ugh. Um, what did I do? Do, 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 do? There must be a X arcs, of course, not arcs X. Yes, right. Um, X plural. Hang on, what am I doing here? So do, do, do. ah, the extended output does not work because it will tile to do it on any folder. And then it says can't access stuff, which is perfectly fine. That's a different problem. But uh, fundamentally, yeah, the idea is that X arcs um, uh, converts whatever comes, you know, as pipe input into an argument. And since we know that um, LS takes actually arguments, then it kind of pipes all the individual folders that are shown uh, by from the call of LS ATC and uh, provides them um, for, you know, calls uh, LS with each of those. So then you have the um, ideally the output if you have the necessary um, permission to do so. If I got that right, still some issue there, I guess. Anywho, um, cool. All right, the other thing I wanted to talk about briefly is a uh, concept of named pipes. Did you talk about this? Named pipes? Okay, um, good. Okay, um, so so this is the kind of piping that's more like ad hoc, right? So you can do it inline and so on, and, and kind of interactively, really. But sometimes you want to have a bit more involved uh, concept of uh, uh, piping when you actually want to, for example, use it for um, process interaction, right? You have two uh, programs, for example, that are supposed to interact, um, and uh, you know you you want to kind of uh, chain input from one to the other, but uh, you may not always be in a but those programs may actually run reasonably persistently. So, um, or you may not be able to control the runtime explicitly using one command line expression and so on, right? Or you don't want to necessarily have a um, sequential execution and so on, because they could do processing concurrently, but uh, as long as their output is kind of, uh, but are synchronized on output basically. And uh, if you do that, that's um, a classic use case for for named pipe, um, what you can do. So, uh, and the idea is that uh, named pipes are effectively, um, the the, the 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 kind of the the, the complement but the key difference is there that they actually are represented explicitly in the file system so if you look at the file system right now uh well uh, that's a bit 
more uses stuff in there than it should be. But in any case, you see directories, regular files right now, right? So, and if you are um, looking at um, creating a, a named pipe, let's say call it pipe one, pipe two, well, doesn't matter. Uh, MK FIFO, that's right. Um, that's right. So um, then you suddenly should have actually an extended um, set. Where's the pipe? Ah, there's the pipe, right? Pipe one, and you'll see it has the prefix P, right? So it's a file in the file system, as most of the things, right? The virtual file system principle in Linux suggests that ideally everything is represented as a file. That's not so much uh, necessarily true anymore, but um, um, the, the, it's definitely the case for those pipe concepts as well. And they only serve one purpose. You see, they have the um, size zero. I forgot the pre uh, the default um, size they support. You can configure that as well. Um, but the, the only purpose is basically to serve this kind of interaction to consume some sort of you know input and provide it to another um, um, kind of um, you know application as output or console terminal. It doesn't really matter what it is, right? So if I run cat pipe right now, for example, you see two things. First of all, it's nothing in the pipe. Surprise, surprise. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, it, it actually blocks. Right, and that's the interesting feature that you can kind of nicely exploit, uh, you know, especially if you want to synchronize programs here, um, or you know, the execution in the widest sense. Because if a program, for example, relies on the pipe for execution as input, uh, it can just wait basically until the actual um, input is um, um, kind of produced quite sensibly, right? So, and if you do something like like you write something to file, I mean, my you know, again, my favorite example here, um, not particularly creative, but if you were to write, for example, the file, uh, the, the directory content to pipe one, you should get the output as soon as it's actually sent to the pipe, right? So you have this kind of blocking behavior that you can nicely interact with. And then, um, so if we kind of iterate over this again, uh, it also ensures that uh, there is a um, kind of a distinctive um, FIFO behavior and that the pipe is actually emptied. The, the thing is that basically the um, concept of name pipes kind of the, the manages the, um, or assures that content is only used and possessed once, right? So it's not duplicated or um, otherwise. So if I, for example, have two um, consumers for a um, for a given pipe that are now blocking and I do the same thing again, uh, well, you know, then it's kind of best effort um, um, based on the system scheduling that defines which of the uh, consumers actually gets uh, the pipe content. In this case is what this particular terminal windows could have well been the other one, but you'll see that none of them blocks anymore, right? So both of them actually then uh, are returning um, eventually. So that's, that's one of the concepts you can use it. So you can, uh, Imagine this as a basis for, you know, developing um, reasonably complex kind of, but I guess primitive in a sense that it's, uh, you know, simple to implement um, the process interaction of uh, different um, uh, programs, especially across programming languages and so on. I think this may come useful in the advanced programming class uh, later on that you'll have first, uh, later on the semester, um, but uh, um, quite a simple principle. Key thing to bear in mind, be aware that you need to have the necessary permissions to write and read from that file. Very important one, right? So if you create a pipe um, file with the wrong user and you're uh, attempting to consume it with a different one, you may be uh, not in the position to do that, basically. Right? And you can also treat it like a file and de delete it afterwards if you um, if you want to as well. So quite straight, it's quite straightforward. But it's really good because um, especially if you uh, develop amongst different developers uh, and, and perhaps even independently control the runtime is quite nice because you have a kind of a shared uh, concept, right? The name pipe literally, uh, you know, including directory and path um, that you can reference, that, you know, with, without kind of negotiating otherwise. You just say the pipe sits there and we communicate this, you know, using this pipe only and you provide input, I provide output. So it's a quite nice uh, coordination feature that's um, provided. Cool. Um, all right. Does it make sense somewhat? It's super brief way I'm going over it, but that's the intent. I just want to share the intuitions because you guys are old enough to figure out the details if you need them anyway. By the way, how would you figure out details about commands you don't know yet or don't know to um, only to a moderate extent? Yeah, man. And the other one? Google, <laughs> I like that one. That's right. Uh, actually, yeah, that's kind of a somewhat <laughs> a good answer, uh, doubtlessly. But let's assume you don't have internet, but you have your distro. Um, so man is definitely the way to go for it because man is basically the full-on um, 
um, you know, like manual associated with, 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 with any command that you possibly find, right? With everything, uh, the complete documentation, if you like it. But in, in most commands, uh, that is not necessarily enforced. It's um, kind of the uh, help command as well, right? So dash dash help. Usually it's more like a synopsis, very short usage uh, description of the tool. Um, and it really, uh, oftentimes I find myself looking for, is if I know the tool, but I just forget the uh, argument or permit and so on, then uh, I'll uh, just use help to just get a brief overview, which will get quite quickly because the man can quickly get a bit uh, exhaustive in terms of the introduction and so on. But if it's then really about understanding a new tool, then man is the way to go. So uh, absolutely, man stands for manual. Uh, as um, well. And if you don't know enough about the manual, well, you can run man man. So then you have a kind of a funny experience uh, because it basically describes the manual in its own right and defines its different sections that you may possibly have. Uh, the manual, as you know, is organized by different sections for different purposes, right? So you see the rough organization there. I don't think, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> to be honest, it de deserves revision if you look at the kind of categories that are in the manual. But overall, it's kind of a right, uh, takes the right angle because some, um, the concepts, some commands uh, can both be, you know, ex uh, um, have a kind of system call dimension uh, where it's being mostly or interesting to users more, right? So if you're more interested from a user perspective, you may look into the menu section one, which only has executable programs that are, for example, relevant for operations, whereas um, the system calls section two, it's more relevant for, um, um, you know, actual system calls and so on. So you can kind of break this down a bit. There's a dedicated system administration command section as well. Um, and so anyway, you know all that. Um, I wanted to switch to process management, but I think in the interest of time, I'll probably do a break now. It's kind of more logical intermission, intermission here right now. But um, hang on, let me use those three minutes um, quite sensibly. And then we have perhaps we get it uh, preceded uh, uh, at 11. Um, um, uh, 11 o'clock. Um, I just sent out an issue last night for the ones that haven't noticed it. I would believe you should have noticed it if you subscribe to the labels. Uh, if anyone has subscribed to the labels knowingly but hasn't received it, please let me know because I'm going to debug this kind of issue, which should not be the case. In any case, I wanted to lay out uh, in continuation uh, of the uh, introduction, kind of the overview I provided in the last session is um, that for the upcoming weeks, that would be next Tuesday, important, next Tuesday and Wednesday and the week thereafter, um, the the um, teaching of Golang. And the teaching of Golang, as I mentioned before, is done by Marish. Um, he was here in the first session anyway, and many of you know him anyway. Bproc is an avid programmer and uh, uh, deeply in, involved in, um, you know, um, the details of uh, many programming languages, including Go, and it doesn't feel sensible to provide a duplicate introduction, uh, even though uh, the programming course will, of course, dive deeper eventually. But I think uh, the initial shared understanding is, you know, um, uh, shared across both courses. So that's why we share this effort. And um, the idea is basically that on a Tuesday 26, that is next week Tuesday, uh, you have a lecture at um, uh, at eight thirty, the usual block from from um, from from eight to ten, but starting at eight thirty by convention there. Um, that is Marsh convention. Um, you'll have a, um, um, a session there. Then our Wednesday slot, pretty much the same slot as of now, uh, with the main difference that Marsh will uh, take the lead. Um, and um, on the second of February, it's the same kind of thing. 8 o'clock, 8.30 rather, and then for Wednesday as well. So, so for two weeks, we deviate from our structure and schedule. It's pretty hard to reschedule it in the scheduler because otherwise I would need to remove PROC 205 and it becomes messy because the scheduling tool is not that comfortable with having two things happening at the same place at the same time, as you may imagine, because that's kind of the thing with schedulers not to deal with this. Um, um, or not to have this problem. And it also is provided under a different Zoom link. So the Zoom link is provided here, including all the necessary access information. Please ensure that you go to that Zoom link on those sessions, right? So you need to kind of keep track yourself, unfortunately, in your calendar that next week um, uh, there is a Tuesday session instead of the Monday session. So no Monday session there. I'll uh, plan to send a reminder uh, uh, on Monday just to remind people for the initial time um, that there is a change in time slots. Um, but I also made this hopefully sufficiently explicit in the wiki that I uh, indicated next to the Zoom link that you may have um, referenced um, that, you know, there's, there are deviating instances and they are linked to the issue. Similarly, that the time that's provided in the timetable may at some instance deviate as per issue as well. 
please uh, again yeah keep an eye on this issue the easiest way of keeping an eye on issue is to, again to subscribe to the labels because then you get notifications again as soon as there's modifications to it I don't think there will be but they also get notifications there are comments to it perhaps some of you comment or marsh comments or whatever else you know there may be some modification um, I hope that kind of makes sense for now um, but for now, I want to give you 15 minutes break first, uh, not to violate my own commitment. Um, so I'm uh, seeing you back here at 11.15 and we talk, we reflect on this in case you have questions and we talk about process management afterwards. Sorry. Yes. So, um, so um, yeah, we are returning to process management and um, so far students have listed a set of different tools that everyone should know um such as htop top um and ps kill for example as another um very powerful tool that you probably need to use well in certain instances but um the the the, the, the key point about uh, knowing about top um in particular is you know sometimes you need to have a fallback htop is not available in any system oftentimes only as part of installation afterwards um and you know again uh the administration of a system starts before you have internet connectivity uh, and not afterwards necessarily. So um, so that's um, worthwhile having those in mind. Cool. You have an understanding of um, those, which is kind of the essence um, anyway. Um, but I want to get into some details and just iterate through some. I hope you see my screen. Fairly convinced you do. They have a set of other tools that are worthwhile perhaps uh, knowing. Of course, Kill. Um, there's also a variant called, let's say, let's let's run top here. So we have top, let's run top in the background. Um, and then we can show uh, jobs, show all the background running jobs, right? So there's um, top running in the background. Um, for example, bring it back to the foreground. Oh, that went sideways. That's uh, all right. Yeah, because I was expecting to be linked to the terminal and it doesn't be, isn't able to relink anymore. So let's see. Um, uh, but what we can do is to run top and then interrupt it. And then then we have a another instance of stopped top, which is not what I intended to see. Um, but the idea is basically that you're able to um, kill so, um kill a, a process by name right for this purpose you can use pkill which attempts to kill processes uh, by name but necessarily succeed also a bit problematic because names are not unique in the system in the first place um similar is like another tool is um prd off like you know if you want to find a prd of a certain um a process that's running such as you know i don't know top for example uh then you can can um identify those quickly as well, so let me just run um, top again, immediately background with all its, I don't know, now it actually picks up on it. Um, pit of top and um, it tells me the process ID, right? So uh, now I identify the process ID of top being uh, 3143, for example. So there are a few helper tools that help you. Why are they relevant, right? Why do we need to know our process IDs? Well, um, I guess the, the 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 key thing is that those are unique identifiers. As everything in Unix systems, there's a lot of unique identifiers for next to everything, uh, uh, you know, including files, um, processes, of course, and um, and so on, and and users as well. Uh, but they are mostly important because you need to know uh, those to kind of address and interact with the uh, processes, in particular by sending them certain signals. Um, you know, if you think about um, signals, um, we, we of course quickly looking at the um hang on i think they're under here um b -b -b yes the signals that we can use um for different tools such as um kill and the idea is that you send processes signals um to kind of indicate what they're supposed to do right so as uh, one part of the interaction so sick in sick kill sick hub um what else do we have hang, hang up is one of them um sick quit from the keyboard and so on a lot of different um, signals that you can actually uh, send how do you send signals to different processes well it generally it's the kill command right so um, and even though it's called kill it doesn't necessarily mean it's killed it's just same as some sort of um, um, you know uh, instruction control instruction uh, control command to a particular process and hopes that it will um, operate accordingly, right? So, and um, by default, the the idea is that um, we're expecting a um, graceful termination. So, um, 
one. I have a set of different examples here, perhaps to motivate this better. Let's see if I can bring this slide up. There you go. Um, you know, different signals. So SIGTERM, for example, has a signal farm at number 15, uh, the uh, interrupt number two. Uh, SIGKILL uh, is nine. And I think very, many of you are kind of acquainted with the uh, kill-9 kind of command, right? With something you really need to bear in mind. Uh, the, the, the main differences there are basically that it does not um, um, you know, await a graceful termination of the program, right? Whereas signal 15, the default one, would um, hope that the process actually, you know, um, shuts down any I.O. or finishes any I.O. and then, uh, you know, properly uh, terminates and unload for memory. And if that's not, not going to happen because the process doesn't uh, respond, then you can force it with kill-9, right? So it's something you, you most likely learned as well. Uh, um, before, so it's um, quite uh, quite quite powerful there. But uh, one shouldn't overuse kill dash nine. You want to assume a certain graceful termination first. Um, so, but what uh, often often happens in con uh, conjunction with this, what I find uh, at least in a pathway student was that they're confusing control Z and control C. So, what's the difference between those two ones? Because those are effectively shortcuts for sending signals to processes. But what 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 is the key difference between those two ones? Just to motivate you a bit in the participate in the chat. Yes, so Cool. So it's about killing the process, yes. And the other one is a control Z is stop. Um, yeah, so what's the difference between those two ones? Yeah, putting out hold, exactly. Thanks, you offer. that's exactly right. So you're not you're not killing it, but you're putting it basically on hold, classical. I mean, you could try that here as well. If I run control Z, you'll see, hang on, the process only stopped. It's not necessarily killed, right? So if you look into jobs, background jobs, I'll see, in fact, I have two ones there. If you move one to foreground, let's see what breaks here. Oh, it comes back, lucky me. And I can, of course, orderly uh, terminate it. You know, the orderly way of terminating top, you know, is Q. Um, but if, if you really want to, you know, assuming that the problem doesn't react, then you have the option of using control C. In that instance, you would not have anything in the, at least not that instance of um, top. Let me remove that one. Ah, cool. I guess I need to... Um, um, deal with that fellow anyway. So let's see. It doesn't show up actually. Anyway. Um, oh, now it's gone. Well, I don't know. So um, th yeah, that's the idea. So that you kind of have a way of um, either interrupting a process or actually killing a process. And why is that relevant? Well, uh, you most likely encounter this in your uh, practice. So if you are um, running a, a process um, or your, your web uh, application and so on, becomes quite challenging because um, if you run Control Z all the time, you quickly see that. Um, cool. Um, you quickly see that that uh, you, your application actually continues to be, you know, of course, be loaded in memory, not necessarily running, but suspended in memory because that's what um, uh, Control Z does. It kind of sends uh, interrupt um, instruction to a given process. Um, but it's not unloaded um, from memory, but it still occupies all the resources. So that also means sockets. Uh, while memory is not the primary concern that you have, the concern you likely have is that it occupies an endpoint, right? So um, that that um, relevant for networking, so socket, different ports and so on. Um, and suddenly you realize, okay, you can't interact with your web service, even you restarted it. And it's, you know, either the service doesn't restart in the first place because it says, hey, hang on, the, the port is already occupied, or you're wondering why, uh, 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 if you had chosen a different port, you're wondering why a particular service may not listen because it may just be suspended in the first place, but the port may still be bound. So those are common uh, challenges that I have uh, seen in the past, especially if you're doing, um, you know, um, development um, um, quite a bit and debugging in the process and so on. So it's important if you interrupt your own uh, um, uh, program, if you run it from command line specifically, use Control C to be really sure and safe that you actually properly stop it uh, as well. Um, so. The, you guys are uh, aware of the ampersand use of you know sh uh, shifting um, executable uh, yeah, programs into background immediately upon instantiation, which is um, perfectly sensible. That's cool. Um, you get an overview using jobs. I just showed that briefly, and then you can also 
I move them back into foreground by um, identifying them more simply by calling foreground and it would take um, the, I believe, latest um, entry in, in jobs if you had multiple ones and brings it back to the foreground. So you can orderly quit it or continue your work with this. So there's the opportunity or option to kind of shift between back and foreground um, there quite conveniently um, in addition to having distinct um, processes. So that's something you just want to be aware of. And if you haven't, um, I'm not sure if you, um, uh, it seems like you should be well settled with you guys, but nevertheless, I just want to earmark this, that you are aware of this. Cool. Any questions so far? No. Um, okay. Service management, uh, system D, did you talk about this in Linux before? Okay, that's a, good. Let's briefly go over this one because that's quite quite useful to know. Uh, it's kind of a standard kind of Linux theme as well, actually. And then there's a lot of baggage from the Unix era. I uh, briefly just want to go through this uh, the concepts here as well. So in Linux, in the as per standard definition, we have um, certain um, uh, run levels. Right, so um, the idea is that Linux can run in various run levels that have different properties, and that again completely borrowed from Unix system, particular from the kind of mainframe use of Unix system, as you will see quite clearly in the characterization of the run levels. So there's a bit of a datedness in there, but nevertheless, can't hurt to have a look at it. So the idea is basically that if you have a run level zero, it means the system is basically at a halt. Right, so the system is supposed to be shut down. In fact, not the um, you know, just from a from a from a operating system side, it does not mean that there's a implied power off like in modern machines. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, you would still need to manually switch it over at that time anyway. But the run level zero would signal, okay, nothing's running more. The operating system is in a shutdown mode, in an orderly shutdown mode, for mostly. And then run level one would be saying, hey, okay, bring the system up, but only a single user and certainly no networking. So that was used as kind of more the emergency mode or administrative mode. So if things went south or you want to prevent anyone uh, from sensibly um, connecting in the first place as an admin you would just put the uh, system in uh, run level one um, so um, and um, uh, while I continue talking what's the command to switch run levels in case you um, have an idea and uh, then you could do administrative tasks uh, actually um, associated with the system but you would not have the fear that anyone else would be on the same you know machine or let alone, let alone the mainframe and then there's the multi-user mode that would allow like multiple users directly connecting to this uh, mainframe using different terminals right so those would be considered local connections on the same machine um, so, and then <laughs> level three would be including networking. So you go to the remote con connection, which is kind of the de default um, uh, runtime mode uh, at that time anyway, because largely console based. And then uh, run level four, which is uh, kind of customizable, but run level five basically added the uh, GUI, right? So you would suddenly be able to actually see, uh, you know, some sort of display output. And then uh, uh, run level six would uh, signal system uh, a reboot. So please reboot the system. So those were basically the commands and they had corresponding meaning uh, in 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 in, um, in Unix and that carried over into uh, Linux as well. There's still a reflection of this, even though this idea has been abandoned a bit. And the idea was very well, quite straightforward and simple that you basically have uh, different services associated with those different uh, run levels and depending on your run level um you would you know th those services would be invoked effectively um uh, you know and um the command to actually initiate it um it would be init so if you find a reference to this you i don't know you may find some stories that people say run init uh, you know uh, six for example for as a reboot um then uh, this still holds uh, for for mostly for those traditional reasons but uh, traditionally you were able to switch between those uh, modes um, I, 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 this is kind of not really too, too contemporary relevant anymore, but I think it's important to kind of know the legacy and then understand why we have those different run level modes and so on. And, uh, if they come up, you know, why they exist and, uh, uh, what they roughly do. So it's a progression from the system, not doing anything towards, you know, some sort of minuscule access towards multi-user access networking and then display representations. Um, quite a neat way. In fact, let's try. Let's just run run level here to see what run level they identifies in its run level five, of course, right? So, uh, which means that everything is um, properly um, 
instantiated, including networking access. So, um, but in, in I think one, the move was going on for some time. There was a lot of critique on this uh, base uh, for, for the system uh, for many excuse reasons. Excuse me, I, yeah. I have a question. Please. Uh, on the run levels, is that uh, anyway connected with like the user mode, kernel mode, or is this something else entirely? Um, the, that is related in a sense that it um, activates this functionality, but fundamentally it's mostly related to the services that your system is providing. Um, so it, no, it's not no, it's not immediately tied to the kernel mode user mode. So in both instances, you may have uh, user mode functionality that's available, or uh, you know, in the whole case, there's no user mode uh, functionality available anymore. But it doesn't have this um, distinctive separation. Uh, there, but it's basically what it means here. Increasingly, run with one onwards, you get more and more additional tools and utilities or services that you can use uh, on top of this. That's the idea. But you can actually customize and define it. So if we look, perhaps even in that's that's a bit of a stretch. Let's see if that still if the Renman still exists. And I wouldn't be surprised if they were not existing anymore. Um, you have a or had at least. Yeah, they still exist. You have the RC folders here. Right, if you see those ones here, and they basically tell you what's happening in this particular distribution, right? So in in, in Ubuntu 2020, in this instance, you know, if I had a different one, maybe slightly different, but it actually tells you what's happening in there. So if we go into one of those uh, directories, let's pick a generous one, such as RC3. Um, so what I've got, hang on. I haven't used that in ages, admittedly, because it hadn't been too relevant anymore. I'm actually surprised that it's still. Um, as prominently existing as it does. Um, you see basically in run level three on this Ubuntu distribution, what would actually be, be launched and started, right? So, and there's two things that, uh, uh, um, or what, what's actually happening here, those are basically uh, executables or rather um, uh, links to executables more, more immediately. So I think they're all um, uh, soft links, yes. And they actually link to executables that sit elsewhere. And all the executables there um, that, you know, are used to start or st kill services, uh, stop services, they are in init D and they're basically just soft links to those ones. And they are started in the order that is prescribed by the name. So you have here uh, S for starting and K for killing. So a run level can also mean that um, particular service is actually removed, right, in principle, and it is executed in the order as indicated by this index here, so S1. And so here you basically see it's just incrementally starting additional services, right? So that's the that's the key idea here. See, let's see, it's an RC um, 6 D. So RC6, for example, which is reboot, basically kills everything, right? So you see that there's a lot of reference services, but it fundamentally just set everything, everything down. Syslog, audio, um, printing, um, display management, Bluetooth, uh, also, I think it's also audio, I'm not sure. Um, and, you know, UID generation, device management, and so on. So um, that's that's the key idea there. So that's how it's tied up. So, and if you look at it, it's actually, I'm not sure if you if you follow this idea, it's actually quite beautiful in a sense that it's so incredibly transparent, right? Because you yourself would be very flexibly able to kind of modify this, adapt it, make your own run levels, well, yeah, uh, it, you know, customize run levels you wanted to. So that's completely permissible, or was per completely permissible. But it has one, one key downside, and that was always related to, to uh, resource allocation in particular and efficient booting. Um, because if you have this assumption that everything is, uh, um, you know, started sequentially, one service after the other, because that was the assumption here that you run, you know, uh, even though they could be run at the same time, what happened in, in practice rather would be that, you know, uh, one um, uh, executable would be invoked after the next one. Um, that this was considered inefficient and um, the community was looking for a more efficient way of kind of managing and starting and booting up systems sort of make them more quickly available basically and uh, there was there were various attempts to move away from the system including uh, an earlier system I think called upstart uh, in Ubuntu systems at least but more prominently then pushed um, system D system daemon effectively um, and um, this is um, particular uh, pushed by the Red Hat community but if we actually look at, uh, anyway, uh, uh, by, uh, in particular pushed by the Red Hat community, I'm wondering if we see any sort of remnant here, but we don't really. Um, 
Yeah. So, um, and, and this has kind of found great prominence and to an extent that it has been included in various distributions. So I briefly want to kind of motivate this. There are some linkage, <laughs> I of course, provide all those resources for you. So you can have a look about this history a bit. There's more like 2015, 2016 kind of material, if you like, because there was a really hot debate as to whether uh, distribution should adopt it or should forego this. Um, I think... Um, Ubuntu 16, if I get it right, 16.04 was the first one to kind of switch to system D, but but don't uh, tie me down to this. But uh, in any case, so it has kind of switched the perspective a bit towards a new concept called um, uh, uh, system D. And just to motivate this super briefly, let's see if I can bring this up on the main screen here. Is basically that uh, there's a comp more comprehensive concept of uh, system management. So it's no longer those li little scripts that are linked together by runtime or by, by run level, which is super convenient, but actually um, uh, separating concepts out by definition. So, you know, um, the original run level system um, would not care about, you know, uh, how many or which kind of sockets are allocated or, uh, you know, which um, uh, file systems uh, a particular service used. That was all left to the services and so on. But the idea in system D is kind of to define, define endpoints of different types. Um, you know, that so-called units that can either be, for example, services, can be timers, can be paths, can be mount points, can be um, sockets and so on. So various other ones that could be managed independently. So the idea was basically there, if you have two services, both of them require network connectivity, well, their respective sockets could already be, you know, allocated earlier before the actual, uh, um, you know, binary is actually instantiated and so on, right? So kind of to loosely couple the instantiation of applications, especially during boot time, because that was the key point that it apparently took too long for Unix system or Linux system to boot up more systematically. And along with this, there's a set of more additional service daemons that are generic, so no longer relying on um, kind of yeah, GNU style utilities or third party utilities to do this, but actually kind of have inbuilt more or less reliable default utilities uh, here. Those aren't, are the ones I want to refer to um, that, you know, people should use and get accustomed to using. And also those utilities kind of integrate a lot more functionality. So this breaks with two principles of the Unix philosophy, that's why it's so contentious, just share that. Uh, one of them is that uh, your theory no longer has a single service. So basically it does multiple things uh, at the same time, which kind of was uh, despised up, uh, or frowned upon to some extent. And second of all, it also gave, um, uh, shifted the perspective from complete openness and transparency to uh, you know, some 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 sort of closeness in a sense, not so much in a license sense, so system D and so on, it's all publicly available, open source and so on. But the data formats, they have become somewhat proprietary. For example, journaling formats, like the log files, I earlier played around a bit with syslog just to show the contents and so on. Uh, this has become a binary format in, in system D, um, at least, you know, the, the, the logs as related to individual services, not the system log, it's still as it is. Uh, and this has led to a lot of uh, contention, uh, basically, um, in this community. I just want to highlight this. So if you're, if you're wondering why people sometimes uh, are somewhat skeptical of System D or have certain views or perspectives, they are based on history, right? So here are the unit types, again, uh, devices, mount points, and anything else we have. But the tool that we use, um, that, that we use uh, for, 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 for managing is actually called um, system D. And I briefly want to go into that one, just show and motivate this a bit. So uh, system D, of course, is a lot of, uh, you know, um, lateral functionality. So it basically shows you some sort of um, a system, system, I shouldn't have done that. That was not a good idea. I just basically started to try to start the system, which is not a good idea. So uh, it gives you an overview. System CTL is, of course, the tool for control, right? System CTL to be used to. And you can look at different uh, services. So let's look at a service. You see the separation here by different uh, unit types. We have sockets, basically, you know, sockets bound as, uh, for networking access, separated from services, which are kind of um, uh, are wrappers for the actual running service of an application. Uh, what service do we have? Ah, let's go with SnapD, right? So we can do something like uh, system CTL. Let's see how far we get. We because we need to be in mind we're doing administrative tasks, so likely we need to we quickly um, we quickly run into issues related to permissions if we don't do anything to the system. But here, this for example, an output uh, of uh, the current status of SnapD, right? SnapD is a software installation service. Um, 
but but the daemon effect of it. And you'll see that it's in loaded where it's loaded from, where it sits, you know, under lib system, D system, snap D service. That's the specification. This file basically just ties together the service and says, oh, your know, executable is here, another executable is here, the libraries are down here, right? So it's kind of loosely coupling uh, this whole service concept in a, a fixed prescribed format. So all this decomposition had to take place as well. So all the services that are running also would, would have need to be kind of re at least wrapped in a service form, sometimes more simplistically and more complex. We're not going to kind of how to write this thing, but just to give an intu intuition. And you see quite interestingly that um, that the service is linked to a socket, for example, right? This execution is triggered by uh, uh, the, the um, um, access to a particular socket, for uh, example. And what you see in addition is, of course, it's a state of it's running, since when it's running and so on its ID, so all this kind of information, the memory it uses, but more importantly, also a snapshot of the lock, which is really kind of useful, right? If you imagine that you have a service, you don't quite know what it does, then you can, uh, or what this current state is and what has happened last, then you can see everything in one view. And this kind of perspective was not really, uh, is a bit challenging because this tool can do slightly too much for, for, for its own good. At least that was a bit of the idea um, there. I think people have grown more accustomed to it, over time, but also I think a compromise also was to provide uh, um, compatibility to um, the original system by emulating some of the functionality um, to some extent. So, and what you can do is then you do things like the co the, the 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 command always works as follows: systemctl. Then the actual instruction that you want to do, I just showed. Um, uh, status right now for particular service, but we could, for example, uh, list units uh, and we list all units. That's something we saw before. It's the default call. Um, and then I think I need to do this like that. If I get my, yes, got the bearing right. So for example, I'm only interested in services right now, not anything else. Then I can parameterize it accordingly. Um, and I can also, um, so it's all services running, for example. And if I only want the ones with the state of that actually running, I can also pre-select their status. What did I do wrong? I think it's list units uh, state. Ah, ah, I see. It's a lower case, I guess. So there you go. All the running services. Who's? Uh, who, uh, sorry, no. All services that. Uh, active. We need to differentiate between active and running. Uh, so um, active services are the ones that are actually potentially loaded, right, by the user or the system. So you can do something like, um, you know, uh, system ctl. Oh, I need to do it too. System ctl um, stop snapd. Let's see how that goes. Mm, yeah. So um, basically said, okay, now the service is stopped, right? If you go back into system CTL status snap D, uh, we can see the, the service is uh, still there, um, but it's um, you know currently inactive, it has been effectively um, stopped, but it can still be triggered, right? The fact that I um, stopped it right now doesn't mean it can't be activated anymore, uh, but the, the trigger points are essential here. So, but if you wanna ensure that the service cannot even be used anymore, then you would need to run uh, uh not to stop but disable in fact right in this instance then the service can't even be instantiated anymore at all right so there's two difference uh there's a bit of a difference between the the, the current active uh, activation status uh, and uh, the ability to activate it in the first place as a service something i'm not going to do for sanity reasons um but fundamentally that's that's an option so here's an overview of all the different functionality hang on give me a second um um, that you know some of the features that are quite useful actually to that. So system CDL is units status of a particular service. Syntax is always uh, command first and then service afterwards. If you had experience with the previous Linux instances, it would be the other way around. You would have something like service, service name, and then uh, the command associated with this. And the reason was basically that the command, uh, you know, start, stop, and so on, was basically injected as an argument into the executable associated with the service, right? So, but here's the other way around. System CTL, activity first, and then the service you're interested in. Um, status, so that's enabling, disabling, stopping, and um, starting or restarting. Reloading only reloads the configuration files. So basically just say, hey, look at your config files. I changed them just now. Uh, or 
if you change them, and then it will just uh, reload the service immediately, uh, test as, a, as to whether something is enabled. And here, of course, the system control functions, right? So an orthodox way of rebooting the system now would be to say systemctl reboot, right? As opposed to just reboot. But eventually, essentially, uh, this uh, just maps onto each other anyway. But this is what's happening under the hood nowadays, that systemctl actually takes care of the execution of uh, your um, uh, the, the system functionality uh, more generally. So this is now your new boot manager that you're kind of using, even though you may not be um, too acquainted with this. Let's see if there's anything else I just want to highlight. Um, the, 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 um, explicitly. So here's the, just to get an overview, this is how you would have started services in a system five, um, system five named after the, you know, um, last big Unix version before the sp split into uh, different branches and so on that uh, Linux still emulates, it would have been the command service and then the name and then start, right? So this is quite the opposite now in the context of system CTL. The idiomatic syntax is different. The other thing I just want to point you to is the journal uh, functionality. So journal CTL it basically can provide you a bit, bit more comprehensive overview of, um, you know, um, kernel activity in particular because um, that's what it manages. And you can basically see everything that's uh, locked there. It has really extensive um, kind of filtering function. You could, for example, filter, let's see if we have any meaningful service installs. Let's use the one I had before. Um, this, this is kind of a bit of a uh, clean um, system right now. So you had explicitly highlights, for example, functionality related to um, um, SnapD, at least this was my intent. So highlight everything that's related to SnapD in the widest sense. So meaning the software installation service, if I got this right. Um, yeah, so that's that's uh, one of the other uh, features that come along with this. So two commands to remember, system CTL and journal CTL. System CTL is certainly more important, but a really convenient one if you just want to see a status of something uh, running. Um, time. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, the last thing I want to turn to is uh, software installation. So how do we install? Um, well, any questions, first of all, perhaps, because this is kind of really a condensed topic into like 10 minutes overview of uh, basic concepts of um, system control in, in, in modern uh, Linux system. But uh, this is a much, much deeper topic, right? If you want to really start building services, writing services and so on. But that's not something we concern ourselves with, because we use uh, abstractions like uh, virtualization for dealing with those um, aspects of it, like, you know, we, we dockerize things instead, but not care so much about um, um, the the core system services. Okay, so it should be relatively straightforward. There's no magic there. Okay, how do we install software in Linux? Or more specifically, in Ubuntu or in Debian? Yes, apt, right? So, and you likely have exposure to that already anyway. So we have apt, we have aptitude, uh, we have apt-get. What's the difference between apt and apt-get as commands? I may not pick up on this, but yay. Uh, can you clarify, Sim? Or is that ah right? Yeah, packet manager. That's right. Uh, yes. Um, yep. Um, that's correct. Which which uh, distribution? Um, so um, um, the main point I'm making here is that, um, of course, the um, software management varies by distribution, but fundamentally always follows the same idea, right? So, um, well, um, just to respond briefly to apt as a wrapper for apt get, yes and not quite, because um, apt is quite a bit uh, is, um, um, is, is a bit richer um, in, in in that it has more visual output, like um, you know, like um, it can also report potentially download speeds. I don't see that here right now and uh, the progress bar and things like this. So it's a bit more beautified effectively of apt-get, but apt-get is the original version and um, I'm not, yeah, I'm, 
that, that you can fall back to. So in, instead of just running apt install as I did just now, you could run apt get install. I just installed SSH for the sake of, um, I don't know, installing it, installing something really, um, because I hadn't had it on this system in the first place. So Seam is clarifying that, yeah, it's the package manager for Manjaro and uh, Arch. Yeah, it is also package manager of Arch, uh, at least supported there. Um, because as far as I understand, uh, Manjaro builds on Arch anyway. Um, so, uh, so, but that's the fundamental idea. So we have app, we have app get, we have uh, aptitude, which is more like a, um, um, ah, an effect install aptitude, a kind of um, UI for, for, for apt and the packages. It's also a good way of kind of getting an overview of what's actually available in the system. Of course, you have the more modern kind of software control things here in, 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 in desktop systems. But we need to bear in mind uh, when we think about cloud, it's particularly relevant to uh, install things on the back end and usually don't have a UI. We wouldn't waste our time with having a UI uh, installation because it's, that's you know um, disproportionately heavy for the value that you get from it. Um, let's see, come on. Let's see if we get this going. Every time I'm streaming, um, it's kind of really slowing down the performance of uh, my machine considerably. But here you see basically that's um, a kind of primitive visual output of all the functionality that you or packages um, that you actually have. There's some opportunity for upgrades that I could probably follow up on. But you'll see organized by by categories, um, games, um, different function, different functionality packages. So you can also use this one basically to install uh, tools as an alternative to um, the apt functionality and that's particularly useful if they don't, don't quite know what you need so just to be aware of this cool someone else is pointing to snap um that's a very good point so um so now we have apt an aptitude for um for for the installation of software packages right so we have um, we have apt install app remove and and so on a lot of functionality attached to that one see if we have a bit of an overview here just to run this um, down quickly so everyone is on top of things Um, no, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Patience, patience, patience. There we go. Um, so some some classical commands that you will probably find is like apt, you know, apt update that you will probably run on your Ubuntu machine. You should in any case uh, to kind of ensure that you uh, receive updates for packages you have installed already. But more importantly here down, what I'm refer referencing is like apt install, apt remove, apt purge, right? So basically installing packages, removing packages, purge packages. And the main difference between uh, the the installation or um, the, the the software management on Linux systems or distributions more more explicitly is that you of course could you know like in Windows, uh, Windows world download software and uh, run the installer in, in best case or even uh, download the source compile it in you know but not necessarily worse but mostly uh, time most time intensive uh, ways uh, and install it on your system right so but those um, principles generally don't have the feature of uninstallation unless it's you know cons considered by the developer in the first place but those package managers like app make this life a bit easier because they allow for that right so you can quickly install ssh and uninstall it and it will take care of you know removing all the files from different directories but potentially keeping configurations and other options and so on and then it also takes care of kind of keeping track of your overall system more generally and how does it do it well um, just to motivate how those um, package management in principle works. I'm not sure if you talked about it. Stop me immediately if you have. But the idea is that unlike in Windows world where you actually download manually your uh, uh, software and install it, your machine is kind of um, uh, mirrored against or your local repository is mirrored against a uh, repository provided by anyone really, but realistically by the distributor of your distribution, let's say by Canonical and so on. But you can host your own repository as well. That's no harm. Uh, mirroring it is not a bad idea. In fact, if you I uh, want to contribute to the community in a sense. But so basically all the software packages are readily compiled and available uh, for you know your distribution. So the effort is merely then to synchronize between your local pack package manager. First of all, am I in track with re respect to the latest packages? Uh, do I know about all those? Uh, and then also uh, retrieving those if you want to install. So you're not installing from anywhere, you're installing specifically from this rep repository. And this offers you certain guarantees. One of them, of course, being that the software is um, uh, compatible with your system, which is an important one. So I'm just uh, running a general update of the system. So I'm basically just synchronizing um, or looking you know, for newer versions of the software that's installed in my system already. And apt update will just tell me what's happening there. Um, 
and uh, but the, what's the advantage of using this um, central repository is that you are more or less guaranteed that the software will run uh, on your system but what you don't uh, um, necessarily have a guarantee for is that it's the most current and latest software right because someone needs to maintain this often based oftentimes based or by volunteer contributions and so on uh, to ensure that it's up to speed uh, and has the latest version of a package so you kind of have a bit of a lock-in effect uh, with respect to vendor specific uh, um, um, you know repositories so it's for some people this is actually a uh, selling point for a particular distribution uh, you know focus on recency uh, so there's this trade-off uh, especially amongst debian based distributions such as the one you know we have um, ubuntu here which is kind of a, a beautified uh, you know, modern version i guess of, of debian but more importantly it made an effort to kind of ensure that packages are reasonably up to date and reasonably quickly Whereas Debian is really years behind in many instances and stable packages are extremely conservative. So you will uh, not have features for a very long time if you're working on the stable branch of Debian, but it's meant for extremely uh, long lasting uh, execution um, um, of, of you know few services in a very stable and reliable fashion. Whereas Ubuntu is more geared towards a bit more interactivity and modernity at, um, at compromise of perhaps stability because you know uh, you, uh, software doesn't need to be have to test it for years before into being introduced into the system in the first place. So in addition to uh, apt update, you have apt upgrade, and this actually takes one step further and says, hey, here those specific ones can actually be updated. Those specific archives can be uh, or packages can be updated in your system. It's just a matter of uh, doing so quite uh, straightforward. So that's the extreme convenience there compared to Windows systems, where you actually need to you know either have third-party software dealing uh, um, doing this for you in a way. Um, this is kind of comes out of the box and makes it very cheap to administer those systems in many um, different um, things. The the difference between um, update and upgrade is as follows. Update just checks, um, bringing back my uh, screen for a second here, hang on my um, slide. What what update does, it merely checks uh, using a package, uh, comp compares the entries or the, the, the software that's installed on your machine, right? As previously installed, um, either based on the base installation or based on, you know, app installed and so on, and checks, are there newer version in the remote repository, right? So, and if so, it tells me, oh yeah, there are 12 updates, right? This just has an informational purpose. And uh, it also is run in the background by Ubuntu generally, in, uh, generally, and it reminds you. So if you get a pop-up saying, hey, you need to install new packages, there are new packages up there. It basically meant that, um, exactly, uh, it's exactly as you say, it basically just tells you, notifies you there are updates and then upgrade is something that you consciously do and say, hey, okay, now I'm actually running the update. So what I did just now was literally saying, okay, pull those 12 new packages and uh, install those on my system, which is about nearly to be done, right? So it includes the download, the unpacking and the configuring and setting up and all that kind of jazz. And then those packages are set up. If, if I afterwards run, for example, update again, it should not, it should, of course, synchronize again, but should tell me that there are no upgrades, uh, updates uh, uh, available to any software that I sort of have. There's also a more uh, challenging function, which is called um, uh, apt dist upgrade. And this one is one that actually takes a step further and actually, um, you know, permits, does not lo only look at, uh, let's say, let, non-core software, if you like, but also distribution uh, central software and green kernel and so on, and affords updates on this one. I have had, or, or entire distributions, let's say you want to shift from Ubuntu 80 to 20, or perhaps in two years to 22. Um, I have less than favorable experiences with this. Uh, usually something goes sideways, so I'm, I'm cautious to recommend any use of this functionality. But I'm, you know, I'm, since you're running a virtual box, you could take a snapshot, for example, and just try it out and see if anything happens. But that said, you have installed the latest versions, so it's probably not much to upgrade in the first place. But the idea is you have a one-stop shop, if you like, uh, for any sort of software installation management in your in your system, right? So, and uh, you can also uninstall, as I mentioned. So if you say uh, sudo apt um, remove ssh, it will kind of provide you with an overview. Okay, that's the kind of stuff I'm planning to remove here right now. If you're okay with this, sure, I'm okay with this. Um, so just to clean it up basically. And if you want to purge the packages, meaning download the packages from the um, uh, system as well. So because it caches the packages that it downloaded previously uh, uh, locally, you can say um, apt purge as well. Okay, um, so, um, and, and of course dependency that may have been installed uh, that um, come with this um, could be, um, 
possibly removed. So if I, uh, it basically, this is kind of the equivalent to update. Uh, it just tells me what can be removed and apt auto remove will remove the corresponding uh, packages. So um, the last thing, someone wrote snap um, and, and uh, just to see the motivation here. So what app does, um, it installs software in your system, right? So it installs the libraries, the executables, configuration files, and it does so according to uh, the um, Linux um, conventions, right? So uh, Linux conventions would mean um, I'm, let's see. So, and it does so by organizing whatever you actually um, uh, download and install according to those different, uh, um, you know, folders, right? ETC is config files, binaries go in here generally, uh, user specific files are under home with the corresponding user directories, mount points are generally here, process um, um, representation. So every file that is uh, instantiated, or sorry, every process that runs has a, a process file embedded in there that you could potentially address in the proc file system. Again, everything should be represented as a file in ideal world. Then you have the root file system and so on, and various other um, 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 folders that have certain standardized meaning, right? So further uh, variables, so files that can change, but I have system-wide availability um, as per software. But the challenge there is that it actually scatters and distributes um, uh, scatters and, uh, and distributes the different, uh, uh, you know, elements of a software package. And the problem is there that in the past there was a lot of issues with compatibility. So you have, for example, um, a, a two installations. So for example, you have software that you're running and that relies on two different versions of Python 2. Uh, and this had, had been kind of a bit of a challenge there because um, uh, th those versions themselves may not necessarily be compatible to each other. There may be conflicts within the same, you know, between two packages of the same kind of software. So it was really hard to kind of deal with this and kind of allow this installation. So there was a bit of a call for more sandboxing on the system at the expense of, of course, space consumption, because suddenly it means, okay, you kind of need to find a way that you sandbox application, but they kind of need to be self-contained. So if you have shared libraries, for example, you can't really make use of those anymore, which is a bit of a of a pity, right? So it was kind of the uh, dependency uh, tree challenge here as visualized briefly. Um, and just to motivate anyone who is not acquainted, just the dependency issue that come that comes uh, come up quite easily and quickly. Here's the dependency tree of Apache 2 web server, bit of a heavy, tool, no doubt there, but nevertheless, just to get an appreciation that you see a subset of the dependencies involves, including specific versions. You see that they require particular versions or versions smaller or bigger than or something like this. So there's a lot of this uh, uh, specificity embedded in there. And uh, the idea is, how do we get rid of this? Well, <clears throat> have it self-contained. And then they are uh, in, 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 in uh, and that's kind of similar to Android's APKs, actually, right? If you think about, um, do we have had mobile programming yet? No, probably not, but it doesn't really matter. But the idea is basically um, that you can uh, install those APK packages, uh, that, that every app is distributed in those fo this form and kind of is isolated from each other, ideally. And uh, the idea was, can we emulate this and borrow this and do this in Ubuntu as well? And of course, in Red Hat as well and everywhere else. So there are two standards that emerged, um, that uh, uh, or three actually in the meantime. Uh, one being Snap, the other one Flatpak, driven by Red Hat. So Snap um, by Canonical, which is the um, creators of Ubuntu. And then more recently, uh, App Image, I believe, um, which is a bit different in style. But the idea is that they essentially have the same idea, not quite the same functionality, but isolating um, you know, software more comprehensively. And they use this Snap daemon. I'm briefly motivated that before, but you can do things like, and that's now I need to hope that, um, my internet connectivity does joins me and it, because th what this does there they go it shows me everything all those snap packages at, that are currently uh, uh related to go that are currently available for example if i run just snap find you get a uh a featured um uh, packages that are available just to give you a feel so it's a lot of go live go instances so they compiler versions of go specifically um uh, nights chess game and so on so uh, think look a bit like this looks a bit like the app store where you basically have a lot of recommendations of new features and older features but you can also filter by features that you deem um, um uh, relevant of course right so engine x is a web server let's see what we have there yes there seems to be a 
Oh no, that's actually a, a derivative. So it's a live streaming server based on Nginx and so on. So not everything is there, but it's getting richer or has become richer and richer and richer in terms of functionality. Your VLC, for example, is provided. And the idea is that you just install this package um, uh, and uninstall it um, um, you know, uh, conveniently. And you avoid this interaction between the different um, um, uh, tools or software. So advantage is isolation. Disadvantage is more space consumption. Uh, and another disadvantage I have figured out is that some instances, things may run kind of not as smooth as they possibly should. I say it with care because things may have improved quite a bit, but in the past there was a bit of a challenge. For the installation of Golang that I recommended or that I kind of provided a list uh, instructions for some time ago, I uh, suggested to do it using Snap. So uh, Snap install Go. Um, um, Golang, I guess. I don't know the specific uh, package name right now, but um, hang on, can figure it out. But uh, uh, this is basically exactly what it does. So instead of uh, doing the manual download process, because the alternative would be to download a uh, tarball uh, and kind of install it uh, by you know manually copying it to the right directory and adjusting path information and all that kind of stuff, but this package does everything for you. And uh, the idea was to explore this, see if it works. In the past, it um, was not kind of really uh, useful yet, but it has um, become a bit more reliable. Let's see if we find Golang right now here. Yeah. Go, there we go. So here's Go uh, kind of as a, as a, as a um, package here, right? So it's a language compiler version 1.15.6, so it's very current. That's another advantage. The um, snap packages are can be contributed by third-party providers. You see this here. Um, that there are some 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 validations um, about uh, regarding the um, you know verifications of the authenticity of the provider, but they can also be third wide third party uh, publishers. So it's very quick to get software in principle into this uh, Snap directory. So that makes it kind of attractive to kind of try out stuff quickly, remove it as well uh, if needed, and so on. Um, anyway, that was just the brief uh, information there. So if you um, so there is, is a set of different ways of installing things. Um, here's some primitive commands uh, that are in. So if you don't have it yet, I mean, all modern versions of uh, 18 or 4 onwards of Ubuntu in any case have snap installed. Uh, here are some commands. You run snap with dash dash help. You see all different commands they have, uh, quite a bit richer than. Um, you can also uh, refresh, refresh, uh, check for updates on the existing installed versions. That's kind of similar to apt update in a way, right? And remove, of course, packages as well. Um, so sometimes you need to append classic. That means basically that um, snap packages may not be completely sandbox. That means that they need to have slightly more interaction with your operating system. The Golang uh, compiler is one of those. So don't feel surprised if you sometimes are forced to kind of be explicit about allowing a bit more lenient interpretation of sandboxing. So there are different, um, again, those different formats. Snap is only one of them, right? So it's the canonical one, which has been adopted by pretty much all mainstream um, distributions in the meantime, including Arch, uh, Linux Mint, which builds on Ubuntu with a different UI, if I understand correctly, CentOS, Gentoo, and even Fedora. And Fedora is uh, kind of the the, uh, the hot stuff uh, from Red Hat, basically. So basically from the opposing camp. Uh, but conversely, the other way around has been adopted as well. So um, Flatpak uh, is also you know adopted by a lot of them. Only downside is that Flatpak, uh, as far as I understand, only allows uh, kind of desktop use uh, to something. Uh, yeah, the packages are made for desktop use primarily whereas a snap is more like for server side use as well. So console only, uh, which kind of gives it a bit of an edge on that perspective. But they also have other trade-offs, uh, but I think those are the most significant ones. App image is kind of a more recent thing and kind of really emulates in a strict sense, the, 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 the kind of um, um, app distribution principles as we know them for mobile systems and just have a single file executable. Um, that also applies to many systems. But I think those are the two dominant ones you wanna know about snap and flat pack when you can come across it. So, um, I mean, yeah, generally software management on uh, Linux is, is actually quite nice. Uh, you know, there are trade-offs. Um, the trade-offs are basically recency um, on the one hand, but uh, on the other hand, you have a certain guarantee that things actually work if you use those packet managers. Um, the thing is, it becomes tricky if they don't work because then you really uh, uh, kind of on your own or in the community in the widest sense, but uh, that's not necessarily a, a great spot to be in uh, then, but it's rarely the case to be honest. Um, 
but it's also a good determinant to to choose your distribution right so if you're interested in recent uh, uh, recency of uh, software packages and so on this may actually uh, bias you towards a particular um, a, a, a particular distribution as well I also provide additional resources and readings so you can read more up uh, on the trade-offs as well. That's at the end of the slide set. I provide the slide set, of course, uh, immediately afterwards. Um, and then you can kind of see an overview of the of the package managers as they are used and some sort of bit more inside discussions from, again, from the time of conception, meaning that, that time when it was a hot topic, uh, the, the trade-offs of Snap and Flatpak. It was a bit of a war around this as well, as we usually find in IT communities. But I think this has mellowed down to an extent that everyone supports nearly everything. So the other comments uh, that I just caught in the chat, and I just want to respond to it very briefly, um, is uh, what about curl? Um, so curl uh, or wget um, are basically tools for downloading software um, packages manually, right? So, but this is really the equivalent of you going to your browser uh, and kind of downloading a software package, and then you're left to your own devices as to how to install it afterwards, right? So, and that's what curl actually does—the command line utility that allows you to do to download, uh, you know, a software from a given from a known location from an HTTP address generally, um, or FTP or whatever else it might be. But that's it. That's all it does. It downloads stuff and um, then it's up to you doing the rest. So it does not deal with anything related to installation per se, but in fact, you would need to look into a package, check the readme and do as it suggests to you yeah, to do. That's basically the idea. So it's quite a bit different in functionality and uh, um, um, underlying, I'm not even sure, perhaps AppGet actually uses curl for the transmission functionality. I just don't know, um, but uh, it's, it's, it has a minuscule, role if at all and it's not generic for package management it's just for downloading things really cool um any other questions or comments i know we i ran over time i realized that right now sorry for that well but we'll conclude uh, very shortly um that's right seem uh, correct uh, responded to the curl point here so um Yep. So there are different package formats as well, um, just to highlight this. So we talked about the kind of more modern um, package distribution systems like Snap and Flatpak, which are generally supported across distributions. But traditionally, the app um, that are just briefly highlighted here is, you know, is, is tightly linked to a heritage of a, a particular distribution and generally a Debian based distribution because they introduced this package management actually in the first place and then has found adaptation across different um, um, uh, distributions and uh, there are different um, um, package formats and tools that you will need to acquaint yourself if you want to use them. For example, the RPM uh, uh, is a very much a standard format as well for Red Hat Enterprise Linux, but also supported by Fedora, uh, of course, and uses YUM as a package manager, open supported by OpenSUSE. There's uh, Slackware, which is kind of really one of those dinosaurs of Linux systems, but uh, a very robust one, which relies on um, a mix of uh, standard formats um, as well as um, like um, zip files effectively with, with kind of a fixed structure in there. And Arch Linux, uh, again, which similar has a kind of um, convention uh, about, you know, distributing packages. Effectively, how you can think about those package types is effectively that they are zip files with a fixed folder structure embedded in there that tells the package manager where to put the files or to remove the files from with some sort of instruction, highly standardized, but it's all kind of an open uh, concept. So if you want to inspect that packages, you can download those individually as well, using curl, for example, and just have a look at them. Um, but uh, the key difference is if you have a dev package, the package manager actually knows what to do with this, right? As opposed to a zip file, if you like, or a, a tarball file, which is more generic, right? So that's the idea. Um, to have certain standards. For some people, that's that's decisive for the choice of their distribution because they feel comfortable with one of the package managers or the recency of the provided packages and so on. So uh, consider this as one of the uh, um, features you want to bear in mind when recommending a distribution or reflecting on which distribution you want to use. So a lot of talking on my side, a lot of fast talking, I guess. Um, any questions or reflections? Also, if I only told you stuff you know already, that's uh, also something I want to learn about. Um, but I, I, I think the main point here is, uh, my important point that I want to make is to kind of to, to prime everyone that we have a rough same understanding when it comes to certain aspects. There will always be uh, some 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 issues that we'll probably even talk about that you know should be settled more deeply. We can do this uh, throughout the course once we identify those. But at least we have a basis under basic understanding of how your system is run. You should be able to manage users, uh, deal with permissions, um, what else? Um, 
install software, of course, uh, do process management um, in a wider sense, service management now as well. So at least, you know, if you want to figure out that SSH is actually running, you know how to do it You're using system CTL, um, principles of piping again, uh, kind of reinforcing the idea that you can change things or you can debug things in between. Um, name pipes that may be useful for you in your, doing development if you want to have interacting services. So a lot of, you know, a uh, bit of um, patchwork, uh, admittedly, but nevertheless kind of touching on interesting aspects um, related to Linux without going to any, um, talking of any about foundations too much, but hopefully with a bit of a uh, conceptual backdrop, very useful. But if there are no other questions right now, I will leave it at this. Uh, for the ones that want to kind of test, refresh, or otherwise interact with Linux, uh, I can also point you. So first of all, I, of course, provide the resources, meaning the slides are just um, uh, shared or some of them. In fact, more uh, than I, what I shared right now, I just provide you with slide sets. I put them down here. There's an additional uh, slide set that uh, would be a more standard introduction to Linux with a lot of different features. So if you want to iterate over that to get clarity, that could be useful. And a very few small set of mini exercises if you want to just play with piping a bit more um, um, specifically, um, you know, just to kind of motivate. Um, and I don't know if you, if you find um, any interest. There's no assessment of that. It's up to you to do this. But I think it could help you just to get you up to scratch and uh, perhaps have a bit of a quiz uh, going on as to uh, whether you can still resolve those issues. Again, no no distinctive assessment, but it's always good to, for you to know where you stand and if you're still up to scratch with respect to your skill set. Good. If there are no more questions. Um, of course, if there are, feel free to ask those. Otherwise, um, feel free to uh, enjoy your lunch break. Deserved lunch break in the meantime because I ran well over time such a convenience to have uh, this particular time slot because it may not be as busily scheduled. Um, but um, now I need to really um, let you go. So thank you very much again for your attendance. From next week onwards, Tierstag, right? So not Mandag, but Tuesday, uh, you're going to meet um, as described in this issue in the different Zoom link. And then we'll see what Golang has to offer. Ah, uh, one, one thing you probably may want to do already is to install Golang in the first place, building on the knowledge you have attained, uh, attained hopefully. Uh, today, give me a second, there is a Golang installation um, wiki page here briefly. So if you can, it would be great to just install this. This is literally one command away on, on, under Linux 2004 um, using snap, in fact. So straightforward if you want. You can see which IDE suits you. I believe Marsh will use Vim as usual, but you, you may likely divert to another one. I would generally use one of those for, for our purposes, but the configuration should be described as well. So if you have this up and running, I think you're in a good position to participate ne next week. If there are other prerequisites, I'll uh, have, uh, you know, we'll write it onto the issue, um, but I don't think so at this stage that we need more than this. Um, cool. Okay, I'll share the stream later on and uh, I hope you have a good afternoon.